Welcome to another edition of the Hawk Off the Press podcast. I'm your host, Gazette Hawkeyes reporter, John Steffi. I am excited to welcome Phil Parker onto the podcast this week. I think Phil kind of goes without any introduction for most Hawkeyes fans, but the Iowa defensive coordinator. Phil, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. Um, it looks like we started off into a good summer and um, looking forward to you know, the, uh, you know, the fall here when we get ready to start up the actually coaching the guys again in the fall. Well, let's start off talking cash. So how have you seen the needs of that position evolve since having Imani Hooker there in 2018? Well, I, I think it's, um, you know, going back and letting me think about this for a while that, you know, when we first was here in 1999, when Norm Parker was a defensive coordinator, I was a secondary coach. I just remember, uh, I think it was Shane Hall that we actually put that that position. And it was, uh, we, you know, there was still a star. We called it a star cash, uh, but usually it was doing the, it was a nickel personnel thing, but it was meant the same thing. Uh, we came up with cash just because of, uh, you know, the, uh, the opportunity to get another guy on the field that uh, be more in the passing game. Uh, match up a little bit better but the thing that really made it switch over I think is I just remember playing Wisconsin and um, one of our linebackers were out there which usually the reason why we had them out there all the time is usually they ran pretty well uh, and they could cover and they they spent more time on the field majority of the time and what we thought is is as that linebacker is going I mean he can do just as much as everybody else and can run just as fast as anybody else until that one play that just kind of made a decision that we were going to uh, make it a, you know, a full-time cash position. And, you know, whether we call it a star or we call it a money, or I thought it was just a good name to call it cash. And I think the evolution of it, as far as, you know, what we expect our guys to do in that is, it's very unique. You got to be able to play man to man. You got to be able to blitz. You got to be able to play zone coverage. So it's multiple tasks and you got to be able to sometimes travel. When I mean travel is you got to look like you're playing a uh, man and sometimes play zone. Uh, so there's a lot of different things that you got to know the run fits, uh, where you fit in the, in the run game. And I think it's challenging. So, you know, it's kind of a, uh, a position that every year we're looking for that guy who can be that guy. And then if you could name – the exact, if you could have any attributes of a player that you could, what would be the perfect one for the cash position? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, everybody you want to, I think you, you got to have the ability to see things at a different level. And, and what, what I mean by that is the understanding uh, and gathering information as fast as you can. And because I think you, you know your advantages and disadvantages when you're playing that position, but there's so many multiple things that have to go on that you have to know when you're the support guy, when you have to fit in certain and run game, but also in the passing game, how are you going to play them and based on the split. So I think the knowledge of that guy really has to be uh, a full time. Uh, football player in the sense of uh, being a student of the game. And when you do that, uh, I think there's a lot of guys out there. We talk about speed, but sometimes it's not always speed because I know there's guys that play faster uh, than the clock they run on the 40 yard dash. So to me, they play faster because they, they anticipate more because they know more, they've seen more and they've done it more. And so to answer your question, I think you just need a guy that's devoted to, to the game. And obviously he does have to have some skill set, obviously, uh, like a hooker, uh, you know, did. And I think, you know, you look at, uh, some other guys, uh, Dane Belton that came in and, and did a really good job after hooker. And it's just, you know, some guys were, ha we're getting more guys having that capability to go inside, but the more you put on their plate, uh, you know, you just don't want to lose the performance of, of the player. 
Would you rather have one person like how it's been the last few years with Belton and before that hooker, or would you possibly see a situation where there are a couple people who are kind of cash by committee? Well, I think the, uh, the more we go in this game, I think there's guys are starting to understand it and they're getting a lot better. I think we have a lot of guys that can start to have a chance to play inside there. Um, Sometimes, though, there's, there are guys that are, you got to sit there and say, hey, would he be better off at being at one position, maybe not the cast position? He, he, you know, he has some things that you like, but is it better for him because he's a young player just to keep him at one position until he starts understanding it a little bit better? And sometimes it's nice when, when you play a safety and, and, and you understand what the guy has to do as a strong safety, know what the cast is then when you have the chance to go down there and play the cash, you have the ability to know that what's behind you and what's the issues that are given to you as a cast position, you know, as being a safety, going back and seeing it from a, a deeper perspective than being up four or five yards from the line of scrimmage. How soon for 2022 would you like to have that cash position figured out? Well, I, I, I think we have a, uh, you know, I think doing the tour days, it's going to give us a, a lot of good help as far as, you know, who is going to be in that position. You know, we got very limited uh, contact with these guys right now as far as uh, working out and, and doing the seven on seven stuff uh, that you're, you're starting to, you know, kind of r- ramp up a little bit to uh, this preseason. But, uh, you know, I'd like to have it done hopefully by, you know, end of camp. I mean, it, it, there's going to be a guy that has to go out there and start it. And obviously uh, somebody's going to have to go out there and do it. Uh, but I, I think there's a, you know, we got a, a lot of guys that have that chance and ability. We're just going to see what the progress is when it comes to camp. Obviously it seems like you're seeing more and more spread offenses as time goes on. Does that mean more cash usage you think down the road? Yeah, I, I think that's, you know, one thing about it is is guys are playing with a lot more 11 personnel and 10 personnel. Uh, you know, you can, you know, the teams, that that's where a lot of the college football is nowadays. You know, obviously uh, in the NFL, that's, you know, you see that a lot. It's a ton of it. It's not, uh, it's more of a passing game. Um, but the, the one thing about it is in, in, in the habit, you got to be able to, still have good players to rotate in there. And, and I always believe that getting, get, you know, make sure that you got the right players on the field and, and be able to keep up with the fast pace and the personnel adjustments that go in there. And, and, you know, sometimes, you know, coaches are at fault for not getting the guys in there when they're supposed to get in there, uh, trying to figure out what personnel is in the game, but uh, on either side, you know, you know, you're trying to figure out offensively what they're putting in there. And, you know, they, they like to hold guys on the sideline, just like we like holding our calls, you know. So, you know, it's a two-way street there. One interesting thing I heard while I was at the NFL Combine was Brock Purdy was saying how with Iowa, you know what you're going to get. And it isn't like they do anything crazy complicated, but they execute it really well and they're really well coached. Why do you think that kind of consistent approach has worked so well for Iowa? Well, I go back to 1999 when Norm Parker came here. Uh, you know, we were a little bit of, uh, I would say at that time, blitzaholics. Um, you know, we blitzed a lot. We had a lot of different packages and stuff. And, and then when we really started playing well, um, it started, you know, really coming down to, it's not how much you really know as a, as a coach. It's how, what, what you, can your players execute out there on the field? And I think the more time you, you, you have, a, you know, you rep it, you rep it. How many times can you rep uh, a thing that you have to do that's going to, you have to be efficient on, on the field. And if you just go ahead and just start throwing up defenses and, and saying, you know, do this, do this on this play and then and call another defense, you got to do this. And then another defense, you got to do that. There's a lot of things going on in, in every 11 of the guys in there of what they have to do. So the more you can stay consistent and knowing that the offenses 
you know, you can call one defense. There are subtle adjustments, but at least you know when they do that, that you're going to be able to adjust it. And the guys that are out there know exactly what the problems are and how to fix the problems. And that's been our biggest asset to it over a period of time and the consistency with the coaching staff of understanding, you know, the notebook has really been basically the same since 1999, you know, with a little bit of a, you know, change a couple words here and there, you know, we used to say personnel groupings were, uh, you know, blue used to be 11 personnel, you know, and it's just really kind of interesting. We had to change that in 19 or 2015 to, you know, whether it's 11, 12 or 10 or, you know, it, it didn't really matter, but, since we changed it, we did go undefeated. So sometimes that changes, but it was all meant the same thing because everybody kept on referring back to, Hey, it's 11 personnel. Oh, that's blue personnel. <laughs> so it really didn't really matter. So, you know, whatever somebody felt comfortable and, and how they approached it, you know, but it works both ways. How has the increased amount of analytics out there? Um, how is that has, or maybe hasn't impacted what you've done as defensive coordinator? Well, I think it's twofold a little bit. I think it's one, it, the analytics that helps you with, uh, you know, hey, what are you going to practice for the week of the game? You know what I mean? And, you know, you get all the statistical things from a defensive standpoint as far as, like, what the offense is trying to do. So that, that that's very help, helpful. And then understanding, you know, really how much are you really going to play goal line defense or how many, how much are you going to really play in the open field or how many times you're at certain parts of the field, how many plays or how many calls can you really have? So you got to be very consistent that that helps me a little bit is like, Hey, how many, how much are we going to practice? How do you, you know, set your day on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, how many third downs are you actually going to see doing a game and how many are you going to be able to practice and how many times you're going to practice that play against the same defense or a different defense to make sure that you're executing, you know, that that's one area that I think it really helps you out is how to plan your weekly, uh, you know, preparation of what you want to do. And then obviously that, you know, to see what, you know, you kind of reverse it a little bit and try to say, hey, what do you do? What is my tendencies that happen to be when I get in certain situations? You know, can I have a chance to change that up? Uh, that That is helpful. Uh, sometimes, you know, there's, there's different times that I, uh, you know, I look at it and I say, okay, they, they know what we do. Why don't we just change it up a little bit? And it's a subtle change. It want to look the same, but change it. Um, whether it's zone or man, you know, hey, we play man all the time. Hey, let's go ahead and throw it to zone, but let's look man, but really play zone. I think that those are the things that I got to be cautious of, of, you know, when I'm trying to call uh, call a defense and, and how we try to prepare as a defensive staff. But then it also comes down to, you know, you got to be, you know, that's one thing to be on the sideline. You got to feel for the game. And you got to understand, you got to understand that offensive coordinator, you got to be able to see and know what he's trying to do. And the one thing about it is it's really good is we've been consistent on what we do defensively. And then we know what people like to do against us. So, you know, the preparation is probably, you know, hey, it's it's easy. You still got to go back and execute, you know, it comes down to you, you might know what we're doing, but if we can do it better than you do, then, you know, then we'll see. But uh, usually that's the way it goes. And I've <clears throat> been very lucky and fortunate to, you know, be under Norm Parker with that consistency. It's, it's not what you know. It's, you know, what does your players and what can they execute? And then you've probably had more success than anybody else in the country at finding the, I hate to use the stars because this shows exactly the problem with the stars, but finding the two star cornerback who then becomes Big Ten defensive back of the year. I don't think between, if looking at last year's starters, Riley Moss wasn't very highly coveted as a recruit. Jack Kerner was a walk-on before. So you just keep on Kayvon Merriweather being a basketball player, probably more so in football in high school. What's 
your way of being able to see when you see somebody like Kayvon, who hasn't necessarily shown as much in football as in basketball, of knowing, hey, this guy could be a starting defensive back in a few years. Well, there's, there's <clears throat> obviously there's a lot of things. I think, you know, within uh, when you're on the recruiting trail, which is a little bit harder nowadays and more, you know, we don't have a chance to be around these kids uh, enough and it takes a little bit longer to get to know them. <clears throat> and sometimes uh, the kids that get the stars, uh, you know, I don't know what they mean. Um, they're the stars. And I think what really has to go, you got to be really cautious of how you go about trying to find a kid that has a love for the game that w wants to make sure that, uh, you know, he doesn't need the attention to play the game, but loves the game of football. And it's very hard to find somebody. And I'm saying it may be, do they have a chip on the show? No, or, or they work or it's football. How important is football to you? Uh, and that's what I try to look for. And, I'll look at guys and, and, and I'll try to have relationships with them and talk to them. And, and really, um, this game is, you know, we're, we're lucky to coach in it and it's to play in it. You got to understand that you're just a piece of the puzzle. You know, the game, the team, the unit, whatever it is, is bigger than who you are. So can you find the right guy to fit into that? uh system and it's really good and it's really nice when you know you go into an off season and you're going through this time where right now went through the spring and you have the guys that you you love to be around because of they know what they have to do to be good and then it, it, the best that they can be right and you know we, we look at it I, I know that you know Everybody looks at a 40. Everybody looks at this. I look at for somebody, how are they going to go about their business? And are they going to be doing the right things they need to do and take care of it? You know, one thing about college sports is, you know, you have to go to school. Yeah, you know, that's a requirement nowadays. Uh, you know, you got to make sure you're learning in the classroom. So I think academics is a big part of it. I know football is it. And then obviously the social life here in Iowa City. So I think all of them have to fit. And not everybody can fit into that system and understand that you put the team first when you're going about uh, preparing for a game. Because if you win and lose, you got to remember this, you know, everybody wins, everybody loses. You're all on the same team. It doesn't matter who you are, whether you're on the scout team player or whether you're, you're a starter, it's all the same uh, as far as, you know, how much have you invested in it? And I look for guys that, you know, invest in the game of football and they love to be out there playing and it doesn't matter how hot it is or how cold it is they'll be out there playing specifically with cave with his basketball accolades did you see that as translating over to football or what specifically caught your eye with him i thought i thought he you know he was when i went to a basketball game i think it was me and kelvin i just went there and, and his ability to very you know not exactly the same, but the way he controlled the court and as, as bringing the ball up or, you know, taking the ball in and dunking it and, and having the skill set that you had to, but the ability to, you know, as a, as a guy coming down the court to see things that some people can't see. And it's hard when you're evaluating, everybody says, what are you talking about? And you can tell by a pass, you can tell by the way things are, you know, they're drawing things up as far as how they're going to the basket or you know, how they're playing defense, what they expect, anticipating, you know, if they are on defense of, of you know, where the ball's going and, and be able to jump in front and, and maybe have a, what I call interception or taking the ball away. So the same thing with Micah Hyde when I was, you know, I went six times to watch Micah Hyde play basketball. And it's at basketball practice. I don't think I ever went and saw him play a game, but there's just his ability to be able to see. And that's kind of the same thing I would see in the cave on it is the ability to deliver the ball, um, get it to the right guy in the right proper angle, and how he's, you know, defending guys on defense and moving your feet 
So those types of things that you can see in other sports and, you know, obviously this, the quality of kid, I just knew he was uh, the locker room. I remember the coach there saying that, you know, he'd be a good guy in your locker room. And obviously that is, it came out to be a really true statement for him as far as how he is a leader and how he takes things personal, as far as how he wants to do things and very happy and pleased the way his progress has gone. And I'm looking forward to seeing how this one uh, finishes up for him. And I'm, I'm sure it's going to finish up pretty fine. Do you think having that basketball background has helped him as a defensive back? Yeah, I think anytime you do sports, I think whether you're playing ba- basketball, whether you're playing baseball or, you know, you got field hockey, whatever you're doing, or you're doing something that you got to be able to say, I think like baseball, you, you got to be able to, you know, everybody says baseball's boring. I think baseball is a very, you know, uh, I love the game as far as how you got to be able to make sure that you're watching everything all the time. And I think it's just the training of somebody's eyes and, and training your mind and, and seeing things, you know, is the guy going to steal or is he not going to steal if you're the pitcher, you know, or what are you going to do? You know, can he still home, you know, on the, on the movement of the, of the pitcher? You know, the little things like that when you start watching baseball, I love it. But the more sports you can play and interact with people, I think the, the better opportunities you have to be successful in the game of football. And you've worked with a pretty impressive list of coaches. A few, obviously, I think Iowa people are pretty familiar with Norm Parker, but also Nick Saban when he was at Toledo. What impact did they have on you as a defensive backs coach and now defensive coordinator? Well, it, it kind of went all the way back to if I started back to uh, my high school coaches as far as, you know, first of all, CYO, the coaches I had there, I thought were very good. And, and then went through high school that, that have uh, Dave Ward was my uh, defensive back coach at the time. And, and it was just interesting when I was leaving uh, high school, he's like, you know, it'd be very hard for you to coach at the high school level. I really didn't understand that. But, uh, but as I went through it and I had Ty Willingham was my secondary coach start first started out at, at Michigan state. And then George Perlis became the head coach there in, in, in 83 season. Uh, Nick Saban became my position coach there as a start. And then he obviously became the defensive coordinator way. Norm Park was there, but I thought they gave a, uh, you know, it was about being detailed and demanding and expectations of, you know, what are you trying to accomplish? You know, you know, if you, if, like I, I see guys do the thing one time, I know you can do it and I expect you to do it. You know, um, you're not going to get a pat on the back from me if I already seen you do it. And, you know, I'm, I know what you did before. So I'm, that's my expectations that your standards always being set. Got very fortunate after that. And, um, you know, another head coach is Dan Simro over at Toledo. He's the one that gave me my first chance being hired there. And then Nick Saban came in after that. And then obviously Gary Pinkle. Uh, but after that, then it became to when I came here, Norm Parker really became the, you know, the biggest mentor uh, for me. He did it when I was a senior. I just remember him talking to me on the, uh, on the way out as a senior and then the opportunity came here at Iowa and he became the defensive coordinator. We, we stayed in touch when I was at Toledo and he was at Vanderbilt at the time. Um, but the opportunity to come here and, and learn under him, very knowledgeable, he can turn in something very complex into a very simple way of understanding. And, and, and that's what we try to do with our kids. I mean, I think we've got a great coaching staff here right now. And a lot of good guys know Norm. Norm's been a big part of my career here, uh, um, understanding it. You know, there for a while, you know, we were blitzaholics in the early 90s, you know, 99, late 99, 2000. And then all of a sudden we came back and our biggest philosophy is let's make sure we can get our kids lined up. They know what they're doing and we'll have a chance to win. And that's what I want to keep it simple. And between Understanding that and the knowledge that he, he gave me as a mentor is to make sure you, uh, you know, he'd always say, let's don't turn these wins into losses. And, and he just, he really meant, meant to say, enjoy the wins you have. They're hard. They're hard to come by. 
and because I always felt like, uh, you know, I didn't enjoy him enough, you know, because every time you, you expect to play better, whether you win or not, right, you, you expect your guys to play at a high level. And if you don't play at that highest level, uh, then you don't think you've, you've done your job as a coach. So our, our guys, obviously winning is a big part of it, but doing it the right way and understanding, are they doing it at their best ability? You, we could win a game and you can still be frustrated about you didn't play well enough. And I think, you know, that happened with Bob Sanders. You know, I used to get on him all the time. He used to play well, but not well enough as what I thought he could play. So that, them are interesting. Then obviously, uh, you know, Norm, but, but the biggest factor right now, and, and one of the reasons why I'm here, obviously, is is Kirk Ferentz's um, ability to to manage. You know, he doesn't micromanage. You know, he lets you what you do, and he's one of the you know great mentors in, in college football. And understanding, he does it the right way, and um, the ability sometimes that he has to see things that maybe you might not see as a coach or in, in some kind of player. Um, he's not a micromanager. Um, he lets you do a thing. And, and obviously he has, I got a lot of great respect for what he's done here and, and how he's gone about how to do it. You know, it's very hard to win and hard to be at one place for this long of time and to do it in the right way with, you know, integrity, with respect and, and so that that's been a uh, a great pleasure. That's why it's hard to leave. You know, that's why most probably that's why I'm here for 24 years either. You know, so I've been very fortunate to have my kids grow up here and, and uh, be part of the Iowa community. And you had opportunities if you wanted to leave when you were just defensive backs coach to be a defensive coordinator at other places, right? Correct. Yeah. So how much was Kirk a factor in keeping you here? One thing about Kirk, Kirk is never going to tell you what to do or you got to do what's best for you. And, and at those moments in time, you know, to me, it's all about our family and what do I want our family to be, you know, um, in this coaching profession, there's a lot of guys that change a lot of t-shirts, hats, different logos and that type of thing. I didn't want to do that with my family. I want to make sure that we had a little bit of stableness and, and, and a great place to raise your kids here in Iowa and a great community. So to me, it's, uh, I've been very fortunate, very fortunate to be in one place for such a long time. I never had the, uh, you know, desire to say, Hey, I wanted to just come here and coach and, and to help kids out. And as it goes through, you know, it wasn't like I was sitting there looking to be the defensive coordinator, you know, just like, uh, you know, you just, you just keep doing your job. And if somebody respects that of what you do, then that's how you, you, you move forward in your positions. And, and I've been very fortunate to be in this place. I, I work with a lot of great people in this building and it's, I haven't gone to work yet, but if, if it becomes work, then, then it's time to go, you know, and it's time to get out. But Kirk makes it so appealing here to, to be able to, you know, be yourself, do what you have to do and, and be able to play at a high level and with the integrity that he, he, he runs this program with. And it's, it's very fortunate, you know, with him being the head coach for so long. And, you know, you look at, you know, the history here, of Hayden Fry, you know, he was here for 20 years and it's hard to do that. Just look around the country and just see how many guys are changing seats, you know, changing the addresses and living in apartments and all that type of thing. But, but very fortunate to have both Norm and, and Kirk be a big part of my coaching career. What was it like with Saban? Because he was a defensive back coach by trade, right? Yes, he was. Um, and you were coaching his favorite position group then. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's very interesting when, when he came to Michigan State, uh, you know, it was very knowledgeable and it was, 
you know, I was very fortunate to play there for three years for him. And then, um, then eventually we went our separate ways and then we met back at, in Toledo and as a head coach, you know, he always wanted to coach the DBs, but he was very, very off, uh, kept his hands off usually with the, the guys when I was there at Toledo and, and, um, uh, with all due respect, you know, I let him throw ball drills once in a while, you know, you know, he'd ask and say, Hey, can I throw the balls in today? But, uh, you know, that's his knack. He loves to coach those guys and he's still doing that. Uh, right now, I think he, he coaches them guys in the back end with, there's another guy, Dean Altabella. He's, he's a guy that I played with there, uh, that's down there working at Alabama with them. And, you know, Nick hasn't changed what he does. He's got the same, same drills, same things, you know, demanding. And so, you know, <clears throat> I think as a secondary coach that the guys that work there for him, uh, I'm sure, you know, they, they go through a lot of them and it's because it's, you know, he's, he's demanding on those coaches and, uh, but he, he wants to coach them. I mean, I, I think he'd rather be uh, coaching those guys and, you know, trying to manage the whole, organization maybe not maybe he likes to do both but uh, uh you know but he's 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 you know left me with some things that, that he's I've, I've been very fortunate to have good guys in my in my career that i've, I've been worked for and uh or what i say is entertainment you know and then take me back to 1999 when you were interviewing with kurt for the db's coach spot yeah, uh, very interesting. I uh, when I, you know, I, I bumped into Norm at uh, at the convention and at Ice Cream Social. Just happened to accidentally bump into him. You know, he's mentioned something like, "Hey, do you would you be interested?" And no, but a couple of weeks later, you know, I get a call and they bring me in for an interview. I'm just trying to keep it short here. Uh, you know, when I first came out here, I. I didn't know the only, I didn't know if I was going to take the job. Uh, my wife was working. She was making way more money than I was making as a, as a coach in Toledo. Uh, it was a hard decision. It wasn't like a slam dunk. Uh, the thing that sold me a little bit was one, obviously, and Norm was, Norm was here and Kirk. Uh, but the, the thing that coaches stayed here for a long period of time, that was part of it, you know, and, you know, you, it's not about the money. It's, it's about the people you're with. And, you know, I thought they were putting a good staff together. There were some connections that we, we knew of some guys on the staff where I was at Toledo, uh, had a connection with Kirk. Uh, obviously me and Norm had the connection and then, you know, very fortunate that uh, everything worked out the way it has. It, you know, that I had the opportunity to sit here and coach young men and, and been at a high level for these guys and to change kids' lives, you know what I mean? So it's been very good at, at the, uh, you know, it was very tough at the beginning, you know, in 99. It's, you know, when every time you have a new change in staff, uh, you know, whether the players, uh, that you didn't recruit or you did, you know, <clears throat> our coaching, you know, everybody has uh, different opinions. Uh, but there was one way Kirk had a vision of what he wanted to do and how he wanted to do it. And then over a period of time with those coaches, I thought uh, it was really good that we, you know, have been, you know, kind of successful and, and to say to be at one place for such a long time with a great head coach and, a guy that uh, has a great integrity. It seemed like 01, 02 is really when things started to be clicking. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I think there was, you know, there was a time point when we started, uh, you know, started developing uh, uh, a culture that, you know, as a team, as those guys went through it and some of the guys on there, obviously, I think one guy changes the, Temple of the uh, of our our defense was Bob Sanders, you know, and 
he was a guy that was, you know, five foot eight, but built like a six, two guy frame wise. And he made a difference of, uh, impact. You talk about a guy that loved the game of football. You talk about a guy that had a six inch punch that was harder than anybody, you know, and he can do it in a heartbeat. And, and he had the vision he could see, he understand how, he, how to get to the ball and what to do when you got to the ball. You know, a lot of respect for what he's done. And, you know, it's very hard for the, his ability to, you know, to find another guy that could, he'd be a perfect cash guy in my mind, which we, he played our nickel guy. And then he obviously played our strong safety, but he set the temple. I just remember it was one time Kirk uh, usually doesn't usually do this, but Hey, do you think we can get this guy on the field here? We haven't won too many games yet, so it really doesn't matter uh, what, what we're doing, but can you get Bob out there? So Bob started the uh, Wisconsin game and we kind of simplified it a little bit for him because, you know, he's new and to learn the system, but, you know, I, I don't know, maybe 15 tackles, a couple hits on the quarterback and, this changed the whole tempo of way you want to think about the game of football. And, you know, he had a great career here, uh, a lot of respect for him. He did the same thing in Indianapolis, in my opinion, from afar, you know, I wasn't there, but what I seen um, from afar and just the way he took it himself and how he played the game there. I think he's, you know, he helped them a little bit, I think to, to go to the Super Bowl and win the Super Bowl. And in my opinion, and I'd say he, he might have been the MVP of the game. In my mind, I, was, I, I mean, I sat there and watched the game. So uh, that's just my opinion. And it seems like I've heard the stories. He was a pretty high intensity guy in practice, too. Yeah, he had, uh, he, he loved to hit. And uh, it was sometimes we'd send him on a blitz. And I remember Carl Jackson here, he was coaching the running backs. and. Sometimes I think it might have been uh, Liddell Betts or, you know, then Freddie Russell. But we'd bring Bob on and, and Bob, Bob wouldn't hold back. Bob would go full goal. It's, you know, foot on gas, no brakes, you know, with him. And, you know, the explosion he had. And, you know, sometimes we had to peel him off the uh, – we had to take him out of practice at times. You know, if he wouldn't do it, he'd get mad at you. If, and then I'd just, okay, you're out. You can't play. You, you don't know how to play. And I think he got better as he went, you know, understood that he couldn't hit guys like he was playing the game. It was just practice. And I think the more that you can understand that, and I think the more he did, it, obviously he did and became a better player. And he was always getting in the right spots. He just wouldn't hit you. Um, and then it just proves that how he grew as a person, and as a player. And obviously, and, and he took that, you know, all the way into the NFL, the same type of uh, mentality. Well, thanks for joining me. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I uh, love the beautiful summer here in Iowa City and uh, going to enjoy it here. We've got a good hard weekend here this weekend and uh, looking forward to seeing our guys on the field, hopefully here shortly. And Looking forward to a good summer. And thanks to our listeners for tuning in to another episode of the Hawk Off the Press podcast. I'll be back with another episode next week. Until then, we will talk Hawks later. Mm-hmm.